this air handler and, and if, um, if I don't make it, if you can't hear me at some point during the next uh, 50 minutes or so, raise your hand and I'll try to get the volume up a little bit. Um, this, uh, I gave my last lecture on hydrocephalus about four years ago, so I think that the resident class uh, that was there now has all worked its way out of our system and into other systems, so I, I don't think I'm going to be repeating myself to residents. Okay, uh, I don't have any conflicts of interest, and uh, um, so let's begin with the definition. This is a good serviceable one. It's an excessive accumulation of cerebrospinal fluid within the brain and cranial cavity, and uh, before we um, start in earnest, I'll give you a, 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 a little uh, review of the basics. So the spaces that are occupied by the cerebrospinal fluid, first uh, the ventricular system, which is this thing here, and if we magnify this little portion here, here you see the lumen of the ventricle, uh, and which is lined with uh, specialized cells, the ependymal cells, which are the gatekeepers between the cerebrospinal fluid here and the brain parenchyma. Now, um, it is not just in the uh, ventricles that you find the CSF, it's also in the subarachnoid spaces, um, uh, which are demonstrated here. Uh, this is the arachnoid uh, uh, meninx right there, and, um, uh, and with this little trabeculae connecting it to the pia. Uh, and uh, so you've got CSF here, you've got CSF in wider open spaces called cisterns. And uh, it's uh, very important to note that the CSF, which is floating along here, uh, has a, a direct connection with the systemic circulation here uh, via the arachnoid granulations and arachnoid villi. These project through the dura mater into these sinuses here. Um, so that uh, <coughs> in this way, um, we have presumably a kind of, um, well, to exaggerate, the sort of spigot that, uh, through which the uh, CSF then can flow out and be absorbed because it's being produced at the rate of four or five hundred mils uh, per 24 hour period. Now. Uh, so here is the classic view of CSF production and circulation. Uh, oops, that went too fast. Okay, um, we've got uh, the CSF being produced by the choroid plexuses within the ventricles. Uh, this CSF then flows by bulk flow uh, 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 through the say, foramen of Monroe and down the aqueduct here into the fourth ventricle. These are the uh, lateral ventricles and the third ventricle here. Um, when you get an obstruction here, you have a triventricular hydrocephalus. Um, uh, if you get an obstruction here in the fourth ventricle, where the fluid comes out and circulates over uh, the uh, cerebellum down into the um, cervical and spinal subarachnoid spaces and up over the convexities where it exits via the uh, the uh, arachnoid um, granulations. Um, well, if you get a block here, then you have a tetraventricular uh, hydrocephalus. Now, um, absorption, as I've said, in the, uh, it seems to occur, uh, according to the classic view, predominantly in the superior sagittal sinus here, where we have the arachnoid villi. And then uh, this, uh, uh, cerebrospinal fluid mixes with the venous blood and is uh, discharged into the sinuses, which are, of course, um, large uh, vein-like structures uh, which are kept patent because they are involved in the, in the, um, the coarse uh, 
epidural membrane. All right, so, uh, so this is it. I just told you how this works. Um, and uh, uh, in the classic view of hydrocephalus is it's divided into two parts, obstructive hydrocephalus, which is due to a block in the uh, ventricular system. Uh, and uh, so that the uh, CSF does not escape the ventricular system into the subarachnoid spaces. Uh, then there's uh, a mysterious entity which is a communicating hydrocephalus, which is an abnormality of CSF absorption. Um, and you don't seem to find the kind of obstruction that you do, uh, which keeps the uh, CSF from exiting the ventricular spaces. Now, we get this distinction from Walter Dandy, uh, who uh, uh, carried out experiments where he injected dye into the ventricles of hydrocephalic uh, children. And he then did a spinal tap to see if the dye showed up in the spinal tap. And if it did, he declared it a uh, hydrocephalus with communication. He also carried out a number of experiments on dogs in which he placed a gauze-soaked band uh, which, uh, with an irritant in it under the um, arachnoid uh, uh, space in the, around the midbrain of the dog. Uh, adhesions formed interrupting the CSS, CSF flow. Uh, whenever you do anything like that, you get a massive inflammatory response and the uh, arachnoid layer is blocked by adhesions. Strangely enough, a hydrocephalus ensued after this. So this is a different kind of obstruction, but it's not obstructing, say, the aqueduct or the foramina that open up the, uh, the fourth ventricle to the subarachnoid space. So uh, I just looked this up in Nelson. Uh, so here are. In the pediatric population, we get communicating hydrocephalus as a result of a hemorrhage, a meningitis, uh, or a meningeal malignancy. Uh, these are caused by the sort of things that you might, uh, that, that, that uh, the dandy produced when he irritated the subarachnoid space. Um, Post-hemorrhagic can mean uh, blood accumulating in the subarachnoid area or uh, and uh, an inflammatory response resulting and so forth. Uh, meningitis, of course, can cause these sorts of adhesions. Achondroplasia is a different situation where you get a stenosis of the, um, uh, of the uh, say, uh, the, the, of the sigmoid sinus because the openings in the, uh, uh, the base of the cranium are not large enough. So, this produces an increase in venous pressure. And I'll get back to that subject. Um, you can get a benign enlargement of the subarachnoid space. In this case, I would call that um, a benign uh, external hydrocephalus of infancy or childhood. Um, we'll get back to that too. Uh, you can have a choroid plexus papilloma, which is a rare sort of thing. This, isn't, this doesn't involve an obstruction of any kind. It's just a tumor of the choroid plexus uh, such that uh, there's an overproduction of cerebral spinal fluid. And non-communicating sources we see in the pediatric population are aqueductal stenosis, can be the infectious or there's an X-linked form, uh, carry malformations, the Dandy Walker malformations, uh, a chromosomal and uh, other syndromes, uh, mass lesions such as tumors and hematomas and abscesses, the uh, vein of Galen um, malformations, which say uh, press in on the aqueduct. Okay, so um, uh, this is a really interesting thing, and Dr. Pramanik, um, I hope uh, I'll be able to talk with him about this later on because it's really interesting. This is a subarachnoid hemorrhage and interventricular hemorrhage of prematurity. So you get these premature babies born and uh, there are respiratory difficulties. This causes an increase in blood pressure. Uh, if I'm 
correct in describing this. And um, so uh, what we have here next to the ventricle is the, the fetal germinal matrix. It's, a, it's an area which is highly enriched in, uh, uh, in, uh, in vascular um, components. And, uh, the, and it has uh, uh, many, many cells close together, but not a very good uh, stromal um, uh, uh, framework in it. Uh, so that um, these cells uh, uh, migrate out from this area. They help to form the, uh, even uh, help to form the cortex, uh, which, is, um, uh, which is opposite it. Um, but it's a highly um, uh, vulnerable area for any kind of stress with a newborn. So that you are likely to get hemorrhages occurring here uh, with increase of blood pressure. And uh, here's one forming in the germinal matrix about to invade the, uh, the ventricle proper. And uh, when this happens, you have an interventricular hemorrhage. Uh, you can have a hydrocephalus that results because you get an inflammatory response in the aqueduct. And, uh, but there has been a great deal of progress recently in treating these premature babies to try to improve the respiratory status of them and avoid these kind of complications, if I'm correct. Okay, uh, so this is a major form. Uh, Chiari 1 is, um, is a, uh, a abnormal growth of the uh, cerebellar tonsils, which can come down into the, uh, uh, through the foramen magnum and block flow there, uh, producing um, uh, sometimes a syrinx as a result due to the force of the, um, of the uh, fluid trying to get through this very narrow space. Um, this, can, uh, uh, this can happen just about at any time of life. People are, there are a number of people who are walking around asymptomatically with carry one type uh, uh, malformations and uh, they can be subject say to a whiplash accident or something like that and then they'll show up with the typical symptoms of headaches and so forth and so on. And there has to be some kind of decompressive surgery back here to, um, <clears throat> to get these people uh, back on their feet. So, so it not only happens in childhood. Um, a carry two, uh, the classic view is that, that there's a caudal tugging on the cerebellar tonsils by the spinal cord as uh, these uh, meningomyelocele get filled uh, with, um, uh, with nerve tissue. And this is sort of a classic, um, um, what looks like a, uh, I guess that's an MRI, showing here the, um, the uh, carry malformation, and here is your spina bifida, a uh, rather small one. Okay, so um, carry twos can happen to adults too, with a cyst formation or whatever uh, in the spinal cord. Now, um, then there's the Dandy Walker anomaly, which is just a, uh, some kind of uh, malformation of the uh, uh, agenesis of the cerebellar vermis and um, so that you have uh, uh, a, a fluid filled space here uh, the, um, the floor of the posterior fossa um, and uh, so uh, there are various degrees and various types of um, uh, outcome depending on the severity of the uh, cerebellar malformation. Now, um, so pediatric hydrocephalus includes congenital hydrocephalus, obviously. Congenital hydrocephalus includes prenatally diagnosed hydrocephalus, obviously. Ultrasound diagnosis uh, then struggles with the idea of ventricular megaly uh, versus hyd uh, a frank hydrocephalus. Um, so this is just some data which I've gotten here about series, which shows um, a fair number of, of 
bursts of congenital hydrocephalus, and this is just some of the associated abnormalities that go along with that. Now, uh, as for ventricular megaly, um, it's measured under fetal ultrasound. Uh, one measures across the, uh, I don't know how clear this is, uh, let me see if I can turn the lights down a little bit because it's awfully hard to, to see. Um, uh, you can see the outline of the occipital horn of this lateral ventricle here. This area of the ventricle is called the atrium. Uh, it's near where the choroid plexus is. You do a uh, diagonal measurement across the atrium to find out uh, uh, what, the, um, uh, what the diameter of that is. And there are you know, normal measurements. Uh, should be less than 10 millimeters at mid gestation. Um, if it gets above that, you begin to consider a, a mild, mild uh, um, ventricular megaly. If it gets above 12 millimeters, you have a frank, uh, severe ventricular megaly. Um, so, and these, um, uh, this ventricular megaly can do, be due either to a, some disruption of the CSF flow or it can be due to abnormal growth of the brain so that you're getting sort of a ventricular megaly ex vacuo because the brain's not growing properly. Now, um, here are some data. Uh, we don't have a national registry for hydrocephalus and it's hard to do follow-up on patients, but uh, this is a couple of studies that came out in around 2005 and uh, uh, here is a prenatally detected ventricular megaly, in this case severe with associated abnormalities which could be detected on the ultrasound. So you get some sense of what the more common abnormalities are. Um, and uh, at pregnancy outcome, uh, quite a number of these patients elected to terminate the pregnancy there were three spontaneous abortions, and uh, about 20% of this original population uh, delivered. Uh, we don't have good follow-up at this point. Uh, we do know about the neonatal deaths. We don't know how many of uh, uh, these uh, abnormalities showed up here in the live borns. It's just limitations of what we have to work with um, with our system. We just have to go to the best papers we can find. So that'll give you some idea of, um, of what you're seeing here. Uh, severe isolated ventricular megaly. Uh, we've got um, a pretty bad pattern as well. Uh, so that uh, far fewer elect, uh, electively terminate. But of live births, you've got 14% uh, with uh, a genesis of the corpus callosum and other structural abnormalities in the 16% neonatal death rate. It's important. Uh, these sort of statistics are important and uh, they're used by people in counseling parents because one of the first things a parent wants to know is my baby has this problem, what are the chances that if I deliver the baby will be okay? So um, here's a mild ventricular megaly situation with uh, associated anomalies um, uh, and it looks like um, you still got a very high rate of spina bifida and such things, um, so that the size of the ventricular dilatation is not always um, a reassuring um, uh, piece of information when you have these uh, associated anomalies. So, um, and you still have a very high death rate uh, after uh, delivery. Now. Um, and here's a mild isolated ventricular megaly, probably the most optimistic of the scenarios that you can have. So, um, intuitively, um, we see that hydrocephalus is caused by an increased volume in CSF in the ventricles, thus an increased pressure against the ventricular walls uh, this could be called a hydraulic press idea of what causes the uh, expansion of the ventricle walls. Um, so 
the pressure volume connection, which is a basic thing in physiology, is uh, obviously in play here. Now you can take uh, anybody, uh, in this case this is a normal child, and you can uh, inject in a kind of reverse lumbar puncture uh, saline into that person's CSF system and if you have a manometer you can measure how the pressure inside that system will rise with the change in volume. So we have a sort of um, uh, a curve that we can establish here. This is done in a normal child. And in fact, these things were done uh, quite a lot. And they're still done on uh, adult patients as, uh, because some workers, uh, some clinicians feel that they can get an idea about the sort of um, reserves that the patient has in a CSF system to handle whatever kind of hydrocephalus that he has or she has. So, um, we get into then the idea of the um, permissiveness versus resistance uh, to expansion in the CSF space. And here are some important definitions. Uh, this is true of just about any organ that you study. Uh, compliance is a measure of the distensibility of some kind of chamber, it can have, could be a, a, a vein or an artery, in this case uh, ventricles. Elastance is the quality of recoiling on removing the pressure. Um, it, we use it often to just mean that it's a reciprocal mathematically of compliance as a measure of resistance to distension. Elasticity is almost the same thing as elastance it stresses the tendency of a structure to go back to its original form after the removal of a deforming force and, and all of these have a mathematical expression as you just saw in the little curve there. Now, uh, so expansion of the ventricles in, it's, it's just intuitive um, if you have an obstruction say of the aqueduct here. So. Um, but what about communicating hydrocephalus? So it remains still something of a mystery. What if the obstruction consists of arachnoid adhesions blocking CSF flow? Uh, they could be in the cortical subarachnoid space here or in the basal systems down here. Uh, and it could be due to a meningitis or a subarachnoid hemorrhage or what have you. Okay, now, um, or the, the obstruction consists of actually blocking outflow from the arachnoid granulations. And uh, so up here uh, is where we see them. Uh, could be due again to hemorrhage or to uh, an infection in infancy. Um, so note that the last two are examples of communicating hydrocephalus. And when we look back at this, um, particularly this sort of version here, we're tempted to think a little bit more dynamically. I, for one, am not convinced that if you have arachnoid adhesions here uh, in the basal systems or the subarachnoid spaces or whatever, that is going to be such a disaster. Um, intuitively, why can't the CSF just go around this area and reach the arachnoid granulations and so forth? And if we're going to use the classic view of CSF circulation, so what's the big deal? Well, um, let's think in terms of a slightly more dynamic definition of hydrocephalus. It's an active distension of the ventricular system of the brain resulting from inadequate passage of CSF from its point of production in the cerebral ventricles to its point of absorption in the systemic circulation. Okay, well, uh, uh, that um, is a little bit more abstract. Okay, um, so according to the man who gave that definition, who's a neurosurgeon named Harold Riquet, he asked the question, is all hydrocephalus obstructive? Except, of course, that for produced by choroid plexus papilloma. Um, uh, so uh, uh, he's a big one at looking in various kinds of adhesions outside the ventricular area. So is hydrocephalus basically, if we think mechanically that way, is it basically a sort of plumbing problem? Well, 
let's draw a little schema here. Um, uh, and uh, just like we had uh, in our diagram of the, uh, of the curve, uh, which I showed you for pressure volume, this is intracranial pressure, the pressure of the cerebrospinal fluid uh, in the brain. Um, this is the ventricular volume. And let's set up a little grid work here where we can talk about small, normal, and large, and low, normal, and high. Now, we can characterize what we've learned so far about hydrocephalus by saying uh, the normal state has a normal intracranial pressure and uh, a normal volume. Uh, an, an untreated hydrocephalus has a high intracranial pressure and a large uh, ventricular volume. A uh, successfully treated hydrocephalus will come back to this state here. So, okay, well then what is this? This is a normal pressure hydrocephalus in which the pressure is basically normal to low normal, but the ventricles are large. How do you get to that state? So this is our exception that sort of drags us out of our, our, our complacency. Uh, it's a form of adult communicating hydrocephalus characterized by enlarged ventricles with normal or slightly elevated intracranial pressure. The signs and symptoms involve a triad of, 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 of ataxia, a, a gait disturbance, a urinary urgency or incontinence, and finally dementia. There are two forms. One, a secondary form, which is due to brain hemorrhage, trauma, meningitis, ventriculitis, etc. It sort of reminds you of that sort of communicating hydrocephalus with the adhesions and all that sort of thing. Uh, and there's an idiopathic form which just seems to arise with no good reason. Now, adult onset hydrocephalus, and you know, uh, there are lots of different kinds. Um, the, uh, uh, it, it emphasizes the CSF outflow obstruction and there are all sorts of causes. This is a sample of about 624 patients with adult onset hydrocephalus. A subarachnoid hemorrhage seems to account for a lot. Here's idiopathic normal pressure hydrocephalus. Tumors forming mass effects, aqueductal stenosis, which you could actually have uh, from childhood on and suddenly it makes itself known in adulthood. Uh, other vascular mass malformations uh, such as, um, well, uh, you can get uh, awful problems from uh, a forming uh, arteriovenous malformation. Uh, various kinds of infarcts, cari, which can come at a later stage, cyst, which can give you a cari too even, and so forth and so on, and then the infections. Now, a lot of these go on to form a normal pressure hydrocephalus in the end. And shunting is really the method of choice for uh, dealing with all of these. Okay, now, here we have a population that does have national indexes and national record keeping. So let's go to Norway and talk about the prevalence of idiopathic normal pressure hydrocephalus in a Norwegian population. Now the idiopathic form is the mysterious kind that just seems to come out of nowhere. Okay, if you're in your 50s, and we're talking about prevalence per 10,000, uh, you're at this level, uh, and as you go into the next decade, the, um, the prevalence rises. Finally, in this decade here, as you're getting grayer and grayer, you see, um, you get uh, a much higher um, percentage. And then these people begin to die off. Some survivors go over here, some new cases here. But if you're above 80, you're at about this level. So um, what this tells you, and now this is a perfectly freehand uh, graph that I've drawn here. I just did it for illustrative purposes. What it shows you is that there is a bimodal age distribution for hydrocephalus, OK? And uh, you get a bunch of cases down here, then you get a bunch of cases up here. Now, um, so what explains ventricular megaly with normal intracranial pressure? The person who first published on this said that, the, that, that was, it was caused by 
some un, in some unobserved time a rise in CSF volume, hence pressure, which um, uh, expanded the ventricles. This is a hydraulic press scenario. And uh, the ventricles expanded until the viscoelastic properties of the surrounding parenchyma stopped the expansion. As the ventricles enlarged, um, the intracranial pressure inside them reverts to normal according to this formula. So this is the force of the ventricles pressing against the, the, um, uh, the brain parenchyma. Uh, this is the pressure of inside the ventricles, the intracranial pressure, and this is the area of the walls. So this pressure then comes back to a normal level because the walls get larger with the, um, uh, with the expansion of the ventricles and the force is, uh, is actually either diminishes or stays the same. So this number gets smaller, goes back to normal. And that explains why you have this normal pressure hydrocephalus. Uh, and uh, Hakim used the classic theory of CSF production and absorption. That's fine, except uh, if you had an expansion of your ventricles, uh, wouldn't you sense it, even if it had a fairly slow onset? So that's one flaw in his, in his theory. This is an extremely naive version of things. Uh, it's based on Pascal's law, and I won't go into this, but uh, it's Laplace's law that really explains the effects that you get when ventricles expand against the brain parenchyma and the brain parenchyma plays a much larger role. So this theory is generally discarded. Also, uh, yeah? Is that sort of equivalent to the idea that if you blow up a balloon... Absolutely. And they let the air out, the balloon yeah. stay big? Yeah, yeah, the balloon, yeah, you stretched it. That, that's an important point because you've, you've, you've caused things to happen to the structure of the walls of the balloon. And that's another part uh, that's important in these hydrocephalus concepts is if you mess up the area, including the ependym, if you mess up the area around the ventricles and they get gliosed, then the ventricles don't go back to their normal, more normal shape because you've just you've created a lot of ruins there and you don't have normal function. Good point. So another hypothesis is, uh, is that there's a, there's a bunch of people around here with a compensated hydrocephalus. They come they come along out of this population here and, um, and they get into um, uh, adolescence, uh, young adulthood, and the decompensation takes place and we find them. In fact, there's a name syndrome of, of, of hydrocephalus in young and middle-aged adults and it's all thought to result mostly from decompensated uh, original hydrocephalus or um, from various uh, things like um, uh, injury infection and so forth which uh, give these people an adult hydrocephalus. Um, now, uh, there's been proposed a very interesting theory, a two-hit hypothesis that says that a bunch of people are starting off with, uh, actually not many because it's a rare condition, with a benign external hydrocephalus of infancy and that this uh, puts them in a compensated state and then, uh, because this guy Bradley found his population of, in, of uh, INPH patients um, uh, had um, a lot of, uh, of uh, small vessel disease and um, uh, hypertension and that sort of thing. Uh, finally, when they try to uh, absorb CSF across the, um, the uh, uh, the ependema, uh, the fluid goes off there, but it's sort of blocked by the fact that they've got all this uh, destruction of the surrounding uh, parenchyma. So it's um, by ischemic lacunae and so forth. So the, peri uh, the result then is the periventricular brain is glyose and stiffened, and the ventricles do not return to their normal shape. And you see this, uh, this is a person with normal pressure hydrocephalus ventricles controlled here by a shunt, but here's an uncontrolled um, uh, INPH uh, a patient, and you see all this periventricular edema around here. And Bradley would say that, um, yeah, uh, the progress of this 
fluid is being stopped by it's just a field of destruction there of, uh, of white matter which has been demyelinated and is attracting and holding water and so forth. So um, we know that a lot of um, uh, from experiments done way early, this is done from the 70s, that actually the choroid plexus is not the sole producer of CSF. In fact, we get over here, these are proportions of CSF produced uh, in, uh, by, uh, measured by an isotope which is injected into the systemic circulation. So this comes out into the, um, into the ventricle and is measured there. But if you do a plexectomy and you remove that choroid plexus, you still get an enormous amount of, um, of uh, fluid coming over the ependymal wall and forming the, CSS, uh, the CSF uh, uh, content there. So um, that should be zero if it's all coming from the uh, choroid plexus. And we know also by, uh, with animal expect experiments when we inject um, molecules that we can follow into the ventricles that they're found in the parenchyma. So it's a two-way street there. So there must be a tremendous absorption of CSF, not just in the um, uh, arachnoid villi, but across the ependymal walls and probably even across the peel membrane there. So, um, uh, so in, in fact, there's one worker in the field who's quite uh, prominent who thinks that as little as 12% of CSF is produced by the um, choroid plexus and uh, there are other sites of production. Now, another hypothesis explaining NPH is the loss of the periventricular elastic recoil with aging. And again, harking back to what uh, uh, Bradley was seeing in there, we talk about these sorts of white matter defects. Um, hypertension and diabetes are common in uh, INPH, so this could certainly lead to these sorts of problems. Uh, and then to try to explain this, uh, uh, Riquette, who uh, is, the, uh, is the author of our current definition of hydrocephalus, proposes a term called brain turgor. It's the intrinsic property of the brain to resist distortion. It's not measurable. We don't really know quite all the components of it. We can only guess at it. Um, but um, uh, you can compare um, uh, brain turgor when it's healthy to a normal fullness and uh, so we can characterize stiffness and elastic elasticity of the brain and so forth by simply referring to that. And this is something familiar, uh, skin turgor, uh, in a patient who's dehydrated for example, the skin does not go back to its normal um, uh, flatness after you if you pull it up, this uh, indicates a dehydration, so this skin has poor turgor. All right, so here we have brain elasticity and turgor. We may assume following a developmental curve because we know about the bipolar, uh, the, sorry, the bimodal distribution of, the, uh, of hydrocephalus. So if you look at premature babies, um, you'll see um, there's a tremendous amount of water in their brains. They haven't myelinated their brains sufficiently. This is why shaken baby syndrome is so serious. Um, and by 15 years, all that uh, pretty much is taken care of. Uh, likewise, if you follow the progress of myelin uh, myelination, you can see in here, the high signal is the myelin. Uh, three months, very little. Eight months and 18 months, it's proceeding apace. So a brain like this has better turgor. It has more resistance to expansion. Now, um, there's something else that comes up which is rather interesting, which is this phenomenon of pseudotumor cerebri, which is a, uh, a disease which uh, in this population, in this age range here, seems to um, affect predominantly females and uh, it's, um, uh, and they are usually obese. Um, now, I don't mean to say that this, um, that this, uh, uh, the height of these things is in any way comparable to this. It's a rare disease, so the height of these columns uh, should be down about this level here, but this is the age range in which you find it. And it's an age range in which people's brain have very good for the most part. 
Now, so here we have the Great Divide, which is where, uh, for example, in the uh, sagittal sinus, you've got the uh, CSF face-to-face, um, -face, uh, its pressure face-to-face -face with the pressure of the superior uh, sagittal sinus. Now, um, uh, if, you, um, if you have normal venous drainage, and you have a slight increase in the intracranial pressure here of, of the CSF, and the blood pressure here is a bit lower, then you get this nice outflow of uh, CSF into the superior sagittal sinus. And that's a normal state of affairs. So we have this interface there. Now, what happens um, when there's increase in intracranial venous pressure? Uh, this could happen as a result of some kind of stenosis, uh, closing off the venous drainage of the brain, or high atrial right pressure. You get these countervailing forces. And this is what you have in um, pseudotumor cerebri. Um, you can also have it in infants with increased um, intracranial venous pressure. Uh, if you've got a stenosis, a baby, for example, with an achondroplasia, um, uh, which has some kind of stenosis which, uh, at the cranial base, which, present, uh, which prevents the normal outflow of blood. Here, the sutures have not closed. You get a big head. You get a, an increase in uh, intracranial pressure and an increase in the venous pressure, which is coming from this stenosis. So large ventricle and hydrocephalus results. So elevated intracranial venous pressure can cause hydrocephalus, whether the sutures are closed or not. And we have this sort of uh, positive feedback loop, a vicious circle, a, um, a, a dance between uh, uh, the intracranial pressure and the increasing um, uh, intracranial venous pressure. Now, um, so this is a state with pseudotumor cerebri, as I've said. Um, and uh, uh, this is just an aside here, and, and somebody uh, maybe has an idea about this, but it's been found that we know that it's uh, predominant uh, among uh, obese females, but it seems that it's this particular type of obesity which is, tends to be associated with it rather than this type of uh, obesity, which kind of is counterintuitive because if you want to have elevated uh, right atrial pressure, y you would think that this kind of obesity would be pressing on the ascending um, uh, vena cava. Uh, so uh, this is little, one of these little puzzles that comes up. And, and when you've got a puzzle like that, that may be uh, in a way of understanding what you're looking at. So not every older person with a large head, hypertension, or diabetes gets an idiopathic normal. So what other forces are at work? Well, there's the pulsatile nature of CSF circulation. If you stick a transducer into your ventricle, this is what you see. You see a pulsatory waveform. And when we talk about intracranial pressure, we're just talking about a mean of this, okay? But the actual um, pressure of the um, CSF is uh, pulsatile with, um, uh, with valleys and so forth and, and high points. Now, um, so these arterial pulsations are responsible for the CSF waveform because with each cardiac cycle approximately 14 mils of blood enters the brain and these pulsations have to be dampened to a steady flow. Otherwise, uh, you're going to wreck your capillary beds. Okay. Now, this happens because of the Windcastle effect. And um, outside the brain, uh, the elastic arteries absorb much of the energy of the, um, of the systolic uh, flow of the blood, that sort of bolus that comes out of the heart systole. And, um, uh, but inside the head, inside the skull, um, Everything is um, dependent on everything else. The skull forms a rigid uh, uh, shell here, non-expanding. Um, all the uh, fluids inside the brain are likewise not compressible. So if you have uh, something like a ventricular megaly here uh, under the Monroe-Kelly hypothesis, uh, you're going to have to maybe, for example, 
uh, press out a bit of your uh, uh, blood that's in the venous compartment of the brain to compensate. Well, this goes on in a regular fashion. Now, um, the two of the purposes of the cerebrospinal fluid are to provide a cushion for the brain. The brain is buoyant, uh, floating in cerebrospinal fluid. It also compensates for these swelling arteries as they're sending blood into the brain. So as you get um, a, uh, a, a, a systolic swelling um, of the veins, uh, CSF is displaced into the cervical spinal subarachnoid space and in diastole the CSF is returned. So there's a nice little mechanism here to overcome the problems. Um, this is the vein, uh, this is the brain's own little uh, uh, Windcastle uh, mechanism. It happens however that um, you can actually produce ventricular megaly by imitating and exaggerating the pulsations, the normal pulsations, of the choroid plexus. Uh, this is done in an experiment with lambs, and uh, they just had a small balloon pulsating with the cardiac cycle, and they produced a ventricular megaly. So there's something very really odd about that. Also, there's a, there's a natural motion of the brain with all of this uh, in and out of the, of the blood. And it's a slight but uh, motion of, slight but, uh, but analyzable motion of the brain, which seems to move um, in a, a kind of um, inward direction toward the ventricles. Now, uh, we have a, uh, a, um, a hydrodynamic theory of intracranial pressure, which is proposed, I've just sort of been describing it, um, this is a, a later advancement of the hydrodynamic theory, uh, hemodynamic theory of intracranial pressure. Under no, normal circumstances, this CSF is exiting back and forth with the pulsations of the large um, arteries and smaller arteries. Um, and it's going back and forth across the foramen magnum here. And there's some compression of the veins. Uh, this is the normal state of affair. Um, there's efficient drainage from the venous reservoir under this circumstance. The venous drainage is not terribly pulsatory. Uh, pulsatory is the less efficient form of fluid movement, the smooth movement being better. Uh, what happens if there's some kind of blockage, uh, partial block of CSF exit? Now imagine, for example, uh, a, a, a Chiari malformation um, then this um, um, motion of the, of, the, uh, of the arteries is still as great, but it's, trans it's transferring its um, uh, pulsations toward the venous component. The inertial effects of trying to move the blood in a pulse pulsatory manner is going to raise the venous pressure. Well, we know if you raise the venous pressure in the brain, you can get a hydrocephalus. And this is thought to be uh, one mechanism for producing an uh, idiopathic normal pressure hydrocephalus. Also, the Windkessel effect is also really screwed up because if you cannot, if this can't be adequately displaced here, you're going to be sending a pulse wave into the capillary bed, which is much greater than the capillary beds like to, like to have. So um, that's going to be bad. Now we talk about pediatric hydrocephalus. Most pediatric hydrocephalus is obstructive, but a lot of it is. A lot of it comes on, and uh, it um, it's not there, and or maybe it's in a compensated state, and it comes on later. So then we get an increase in intracranial pressure. What happens if we follow our pressure volume curve? What happens to these pulsations? Uh, of CSF. Well, the higher you get, the more energy these pulsations have. The, the, the amplitude of these pulsations increases. So that's a rather nasty state of affair for kids who have um, an increased intracranial pressure. So, um, so what have progress have we made in hydrocephalus? Well, we've got really the last 50 years great improvements in neuroimaging and 
And uh, we do the endoscopic third ventriculostomy, which is a really nice procedure, which, is, um, uh, which helps us. Uh, basically, if we have a, an obstructed aqueduct, we can bypass that by putting a hole in the floor of the third ventricle so that this comes out into the uh, basal cisterns, the fluid comes out in the basal cisterns. Good way of, of having the kid avoid a shunt. Um, shunts, they're indispensable and, and imperfect. We now have adjustable valve shunts, so we don't have to change the shunt every time we want to set it to a new pressure. Uh, but shunts are basically non-physiological. Um, they are, um, for example, if you put a normal person on a, on a uh, tilt table, you get this orthostatic effect where um, the intracranial pressure in the brain goes down, but then it, you know, regains its equilibrium afterwards. If you have a shunted patient, um, you put them on a tilt table, tilt them up. If they don't have a, um, a anti-siphon uh, uh, unit in their shunt, you get this sort of thing, which is just like out of control. Also, um, Here's our little scheme here that we started off with. Talked about untreated hydrocephalus, normal pressure hydrocephalus, pseudotumor severi, which we got to the normal. Say, this is another sort of thing where you've got a leak in the cerebrospinal fluid system. But look at all these weird things here. We can fill in every cell in this scheme um, by looking at what happens to people who get shunted there are very odd states. It's something called normal volume hydrocephalus. It's like pseudotumor cerebri in terms of its symptoms. There's a slit ventricle syndrome that we get here where the ventricles are small because of, um, uh, for various regions. And this can even uh, happen uh, uh, with, uh, with low intracranial pressure. Then we have these peculiar things here of the low pressure hydrocephalic state or the negative pressure hydrocephalus, all sorts of weird things uh, as a condition of shunting. So, um, what are our future directions? Well, can we do more animal studies? Oh, yeah, we can always do them. We've learned a lot from animals. But quadrupeds have quite a different way of absorbing their CSF. They do it more along the, uh, the the spinal column, they do it through the, the, the nasal lymphatics and things like that, and uh, they're not quite like us. Um, and what we, we're at a stage now where we need to look at subtleties. So I don't think that um, the, the animal models are so great for us. So we should look with advanced MRI imaging techniques uh, using non-invasive techniques, which we can now, uh, to look at, and we can do this with cinephase uh, MRI and things like that, we can actually look at cerebral blood flow uh, and CSF flow, and we can measure the pressure of both non-invasively. So that is uh, really cool stuff that's come up in the last 15 years or so. We can measure compliance and elastance in this way, and um, uh, white matter integrity, of course, um, metabolism in these various areas, PET scans and that sort of thing, functional MRI, uh, and uh, we can also, you know, all this business of brain connectivity is a big deal. Um, for example, this little business here about um, measuring compliance in the last, is, there is a technique which, um, in which a person is put into an MRI donut and uh, some kind of um, uh, force is exerted to the, uh, to the brain a vibratory force which essentially moves the brain. It's going to jiggle the brain a little bit while the uh, MRI is being <coughs> taken. This tells you how rigid, how stiff the brain is. And this purple here, this purple area around this, this person with normal pressure hydrocephalus shows that there's a large area of basically inelastic parenchyma compared to a normal control which has much less of that. So that's a real cool thing. It's not really practical as yet, um, but uh, developed it might be a really good way of visualizing this parameter we have rather loosely called brain turgor. Then, um, but it's important when we do this to look at pre-symptomatic patients and do these longitudinal studies because it's the, 
once you get a person with a normal pressure hydrocephalus, once you get a person with any kind of hydrocephalus, the damage is already done. It's um, for the communicating hydrocephaluses, which is so subtle, it's hard to find what the precipitating factors were. What things started it, one thing, what things kept it going, unless you can follow it over time. And we're not going to get anywhere unless we understand at the molecular level the CSF production, absorption, and how the CSF system reacts to various perturbations. You know, in cancer, we know how to study cancer. It's complicated, but we know how to do it because we know what kind of disease cancer is. It's a, it's a genetic disease where we have gene mutations that produce malfunctions of various kinds. We don't have anything like that. We don't have any paradigm for studying um, uh, hydrocephalus. Uh, but if we're going to do something, we've got to have to eventually get into this area, which the cancer people have done so well with. Uh, thank you. Any questions? Quite a comprehensive and, uh, great presentation. Yeah. Any questions? I think that was a fabulous, uh, fabulous presentation. I loved your slides on the anatomy, uh, physiology, and physics, which I think all residents should know. Let me make a few comments. Yes. You know, you were talking about preemies, and I want to look at my residents over time I'm walking out. But anyway, <laughs> babies' brains, premature babies' brains are pressure passive. So when you're managing them, you have to be very careful. You're looking at the blood pressure. Is the baby breathing synchronously uh, with, with the ventilator or CPAP, if not, that's a kid because of the pressure passing on lack of autoregulation of cerebral blood flow, they're a high risk, as he said. The journal matrix hand raised in post time So that's one practical point I want to leave with you. Second practical point I've seen, some folks make a mistake that in our babies, as you know, they are at increased risk not only of hemorrhage, but we as neonatologists more worry more about what? What disease? PBI, right? Periventricular liquid malacia because the blood flow to the periventricular area is altered. So as the baby grows, as he said, the ventricles dilate to occupy that space. So it's like an X vacuo hydrocephalus, but it is not. So the ventricles, the pressure volume uh, issues are not there. The volume is increased, but the pressure is not. So you have to be very careful. Those are the kids you do not want to put them on uh, BB shunt or put a reservoir in them. The second thing is, you know, neurosurgeons are always very hesitant in putting in shunts because of the risk of shunt in these kids, uh, because many of them will arrest on their own. So you have to be very, very careful before you do a major procedure like putting in a shunt. That's what I'm trying to make a point out there in these kids. The third practical point is not neonates, but in infants. And I've seen that. That's what I want to share with you. It's very rare. As he pointed out, if you have an arnold Carey type 1, or if you have actually ductal stenosis, or you have a papilloma, and the pressure may be slightly delayed, and the baby comes to you, you suspect meningitis, or whatever cause is coming to your ER with seizure, and you do a lumbar puncture, there's a good possibility you'll kill that kid because you'll cause herniation of the uh, cerebellum in that, and therefore the respiratory center will be compressed right here. So keep that in the back of your mind that you have to be absolutely certain that the kid doesn't have it. And some Neurologists recommend that you do a CT scan before that. The last point I want to leave with you guys is in his anatomy slides, he was so clear as to when would you do an ultrasound, when would you do a CT scan, when would you do an MRI. I want you all to think about that because in our premies we do ultrasound most often, but if you're suspecting any lesion of the brain intracerebral, you do a CAT scan. If you're suspecting anything in the lower part of the brain or cerebellum, or if you're thinking of RL carry malformation, the investigation of choice is an MRI. That'll give you the detailed anatomy and the communication between the cerebral and the subarachnoid uh, CSF. Is there a communication? Thank you. Thank you. Right. Yes. Give it a, uh, can we do, uh, given the time, we've got to get people to various places, so we're going to have to close. But my crowd is more than happy to take comments or questions up front. So let's go ahead and close right around. Thank you, Dr. Crowley. And